Salutations, respective viewers. This is George from Ireland. I'm on Harcourt Street in Dublin. Behind me is the house where Edward Henry Castle was born in 1854. Um, he is best known as being the man who ensured that Northern Ireland remained within the United Kingdom. So that uh, caused the partition of Ireland when many people in the South wanted uh, Ireland to leave the United Kingdom. Uh, Carson's father was a highly successful architect and that's why they had this uh, fine address uh, very close to St Stephen's Green in Dublin, very much the place to live. It's uh, five stories high including the basement. I know it doesn't look beautiful, it's currently unoccupied, but uh, you've got to remember what uh, pokey uh, hovels most people were living in at the time. Yeah, it's this fallacy that got about that Carson uh, was of Italian descent and his grandfather's a hat maker or something like that. It's not true. His grandfather moved from Dumfriesshire in uh, Scotland. On his mother's side, he was a Lambert. Um, his mother's family had lived in Galway for a long time. They came to Ireland with Cromwell's men. So uh, that's not the most popular background to have. Anyhow, um, uh, Carson was a very bright boy. He went to um, uh, Arlington House, school in Pontmore to Arlington. He was nicknamed Ossa, as in bones, the Latin word. I'm not sure, quite sure why. Was he a bit on the skinny side, perhaps? Then he went up to Trinity College, Dublin, where um, he was a very distinguished debater and no slouch intellectually. So he uh, proposed motions such as that women ought to be allowed to vote, the French Revolution had been laudable, that uh, capital punishment ought to be uh, abolished. These were exceptionally liberal positions at the time. Now some people have said, oh that shows um, he was a radical. Well not necessarily so. Anybody who knows the first thing about debating will realise people propose motions sometimes uh, just for the hell of it, sometimes for the intellectual exercise of arguing a case whether they believe in it or not. This is like um, dialectical education. What well, his views were on these issues I'm not sure. However, he sort of led more towards the Liberal Party at the time because uh, if you recall when he went up to Trinity in the early 1870s, the Liberal Party was still a going concern here in Ireland. That, um, uh, every Irish member of parliament was either a liberal or a conservative. A few of them believed in repeal, others didn't. It was um, a placid period in Irish politics, about to become much more tense with the break of the Home Rule Party and with the land war in the late 1870s, as in um, tenants wanting the three Fs, fair rent, fixity of tenure, um, and uh, compensation for any, any um, uh, any improvements they made to the land. I can't remember what that word is, like free sale something like that. They could sell on their tenancy, the remainder of their tenancy. So uh, he uh, was then called to the Bar of Ireland and that also involved um, spending some time um, as a pupil in England because uh, um, someone who's, being, who's, who's been called to the Bar then has to act as a pupil, as in an assistant to a fully qualified barrister. Or in Ireland we actually call it a devil, so deviling, helping uh, someone who's already an established barrister. And having done that successfully then he could uh, get briefs so people, clients go to solicitors and solicitors then instruct barristers and barristers act for their clients, don't deal with them directly. So uh, given his uh, extraordinary oratorical talents and his academic prowess, he prospered at the bar where many have failed because um, uh, young barristers are often impecunious. Um, so he practiced here at the Bar of, of Ireland and indeed at the Bar of England, involved in all sorts of cases, criminal cases too. Uh, and only then did he, did he drift into unionist politics. He was elected a member of parliament for Trinity College Dublin because university graduates, and there were precious few of them, had a second vote. A university graduate could vote in the constituency where he resided, had to be a he of course, and, and for um, his university. It goes back to the mid Middle Ages when universities were outside governmental control, they were ecclesiastical institutions, so some people had two votes in parliamentary elections. So it was a non-territorial constituency. Um, the National University of Ireland also was able to elect MPs. Oxford and Cambridge, both of them had MPs. The London University, the Scottish Universities banded together to elect one MP and so on. Remember the National University of Ireland, even to this day, it's really speaking one university. UCD, UCC, UCG, a couple of other places, I think Maynooth. That's all one university, despite them being separate colleges. Degrees awarded by the National University of Ireland. Um, so uh, he was dead against Home Rule and he was unusual as, as the Unionist movement became more of an Ulster thing and he was a Dubliner who had a mild Dublin brogue. Um, so uh, 
the situation wasn't too tense, tense until about 1912, when the Liberal government said they would bring in the Home Rule Act, and he was dead against it. Now, um, he cared about Ireland as a whole, and he thought that, um, that uh, Home Rule would be bad for the whole of Ireland. After his first wife died, he declared, there now remains only my love for Ireland. He had a few children with her. He remarried the next year, went on to have one son, who was born in Castle, was pretty old, about 60. Um, so then it was all about forming the Ulster Volunteer Force, the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant, which he signed in Belfast City Hall. He was the first man to sign it, despite not being from Ulster. People in the rest of Ireland could sign it if they could prove that they were born in Ulster, because who counts as being uh, an Ulsterman? So um, if you read the um, Ulster Solemn League and Covenant, uh, it does say that they think it would be catastrophic for the whole of Ireland, not just Ulster. I remember uh, many Unionists and Protestants, and they overlap considerably, identified with all Ireland institutions like the Bank of Ireland was quite a Protestant dominated one, or the Church of Ireland, or the Orange Orders run by the Grand Lodge of Ireland. Um, however, it became unrealistic to try and stop Home Rule for the whole of Ireland, could they at least stop it for Ulster? And then, then Carson said, well, there's a question of definition. Uh, what's Ulster? We, well, we think it's nine counties traditionally, but count, um, provincial boundaries have changed. There's a time when Louth was considered to be uh, an Ulster county, and Clare was part of Connacht centuries ago. So. Nine counties might be too much. Three of these counties had a clear Nash's majority. For Manor and Tyrone, probably slight Nash's majority. But anyway, it went for six counties again. So um, they formed the Ulster Volunteer Force and they brought in they brought in rifles which they purchased uh, in Belgium. But I think they were German manufactured ones. So the UVF had a very slick campaign. They had a decoy ship landing in Belfast for the RIC to go and raise that. But uh, it was uh, quite disgraceful the way he broke the law, given he prided himself as a constitutional character. Having the UVF cut telephone wires, um, take pr policemen hostage and uh, lock them up, especially if they were Catholics and, and therefore suspected of being home rulers. And in the middle of the night, at various different points, these Mauser rifles were landed and they'd organized how they're gonna be spirited away and hidden in various locations. Um, but uh, the import of these weapons actually wasn't illegal um, because there was some act of parliament against it that was a legal challenge which delayed it, nor indeed was drilling because Carson, with his fine legal mind, dug out uh, a statute from decades before which said that um, magistrates could authorise drilling if it was for a militia and the UVF had itself designated a militia. Sympathetic magistrates, that's junior judges, authorised what they were doing. Um, but nevertheless, they had certainly broken the law as part of it. Um, and was this treason? He said, I don't care tuppence what is treason. And the First World War broke out, um, and Lord Kitchener, who was a Kerryman, wrote saying, send me the Ulster Volunteers. Although Kitchener had a distinct distaste for these um, uh, volunteer units of any kind and viewed politics with contempt. So many UVF men went off to join the army. There was, a, there was the 36th Division of the British Army, there was the Ulster Division, and there was the 16th Irish division, and most of those soldiers came from the south of Ireland. By the way, in the in the Ulster division, about 25% of those soldiers were Catholic, so not everybody in the in the Ulster division came from the UVF at all, and not all UVF members joined. So um, by the end of the Second World War, sorry, the First World War, there was no chance of excluding the, the, the south of Ireland from Home Rule. The Home Rule Act had in fact been passed in in September 1914. So was it disgraceful that he was willing to consider um, disobeying the law? Because the thing is, the Unionists said, well, well, there's a law that Nationalists don't like, they must obey it. That's that, the law is the law. But when there's a law that we don't like, we're quite, we're quite uh, entitled to break that. That's hypocritical. What source for the goose is source for the gander. And of course, there'd been the, the um, Curra mutiny of March 1914 when about 50 army officers in the Curra, that's a military base in the middle of Ireland, said they would rather resign their commissions and enforce home rule. Amongst them was uh, Hubert Goff from a, um, an Ulster Unionist family, and no action was taken against them. So uh, then uh, the First World War came to an end. There was a conflict in the south, and uh, Carson was saying, we'll, have no, we'll tolerate no Sinn Féin up here in the north. So there was a Government of Ireland Act in 1920, and the Parliament of, uh, of Northern Ireland was established, uh, Carson was elected for the Duncairn Division of Belfast, but when the uh, Parliament of Northern Ireland met in June 1921 for the first time, he chose not to be the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. He largely retired from politics, but, uh, so was ennobled, and his um, uh, confrere, um, Sir James Craig, became Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, 
and uh, he got the title by Count Craigavon. But uh, Carson said, we must welcome Catholics who are loyalists, uh, who are willing to support us. Unfortunately, this was not heeded, and by this time, a vicious sectarian campaign had started the Belfast pogroms. Uh, a terrorist organization, calling it the Ulster Protestant Association, started bestial attacks on Catholic men, murdering a few hundred Catholic men, 1919 to 22. So Carson, he lived in England his last few years, dying in 1935. His body was transported back to Belfast by warship. He's interred at St Anne's Cathedral there, and his tomb bears but one word, Carson, as though he should need no introduction.